Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining our, our session this afternoon called Interdependence Interdepend and Enablement. And we're very happy to have three speakers with us this afternoon. Um, so first of all, just uh, welcome you to the virtual 12th International Dementia Conference. Um, we're having a two-day conference today and tomorrow with a lot of interesting sessions, and we hope that you can make it to many of them. I'm Kim Tully. I'm your Engaging Dementia host for the day. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to chat me and I will respond to you when I can. Um, we have three speakers today, as I mentioned. We have Robert Hagen, Kieran Murray, and Emma Gannon, and I'll introduce them each in a second. Um, while you're uh, paying attention today, please note that we're recording the session so that you can look back later. We're also gonna be putting these on our YouTube channel in the very near future, and we'll be communicating that. So now it is time to start. So I'm gonna first start by introducing Robert Hagen, the senior lecturer in social work at the Manchester Metropolitan Community and ask him to share his information with us. Okay, um, thank you, Kim, for, for your welcome and, and hello everyone. It's nice to be with you today. So my name is Robert Hagen. I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University in uh, the north of England. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from Manchester, I'm uh, closer to, uh, to Dublin. Um, I grew up in Belfast. Uh, so I've pre previously, I've been a social worker. I've worked actually in social housing. I've also worked uh, as a community educator as well. And uh, my research has primarily been with, about older people's social lives. So I was particularly interested in engaging in this project, which was about people who had dementia, but actually uh, running things for themselves, running groups for themselves. And I suppose the fundamental idea behind the presentation here this afternoon is thinking about the, the way that capacity and capability of those who have early stages dementia is often really uh, misunderstood or, or misrecognized, if you like. And it's about the fact that these individuals can take control and have a voice regarding their situation. So in terms of the organization that we're looking at this afternoon, it's a uh, charity that was founded in January, 2015. And there are some paid staff and facilitators but it's important to say that the organization was founded and is led by individuals who have been diagnosed with dementia. And you can ho hopefully tell from the four main aims that are stated here that the organization is very much into the idea of empowering those with dementia and also ensuring that they have a voice. So it's about, these aims are really about the individual speaking up for themselves, not having somebody else speak on their behalf. That's an important aspect of the charity's work. As one person on the charity's website actually puts it, just because you have a diagnosis of dementia, you just don't lie down. So just to show you some of the location of the groups, you, know, you might be able to see on the right hand side, I'm not sure, but there's a couple of, of uh, dots uh, in the Belfast area, one dot up near Derry and one down near Urbanstown in a skill and direction. So the groups are located in various parts of Northern Ireland. And I should just say that these groups that are run by this organization, they're not called support groups. They're explicitly called empowerment groups. So they, they're right from the outset, there is an intention about what these groups are actually doing and what their aims are um, and their intentions, as I say. So groups have, have been built up slowly over a period of time. They're interested in advocating for change. They want to encourage group members' voice to be heard. Um, it's probably fair to say it's not for everyone. Some people come for one week and then think, no, that's not for me. As one of the group members said, it's not a tea and biscuit group, okay? It's not people sitting around and just socializing. Although there are some social activities that the group do. For example, there have been cinema trips. There has been dementia friendly tennis. Uh, they've gone to watch ice hockey and so on and so forth. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is the more purposeful aspect of the group, which is delivering education services to the public and also being involved in consultations with policymakers. 
I just wanted to show you a profile of the interviewees. Uh, you'll be able to see that the quite a wide range of ages, the youngest participant being 48, the oldest being 80. Uh, in fact, five of the group are under, when a time of interview were under the age of 60. Uh, she'd also say that some of the interviewees had recently been diagnosed with dementia, but many had been three, four, five years with dementia. And so you can see that maybe there's, there's quite a few of these who would have been maybe you could call young onset dementia, if you like. Um, so just to, to give you a sense of, of who the participants actually are. I'm thinking about actually how the, the participants actually joined the group. Um, I've written an article uh, already about the step uh, or the process from diagnosis to, to joining the group and one of the things that is interesting to notice you might see from the table here is that only one of the group was uh, referred on to the charity by their GP the rest were actually either through people like dementia navigators through friends uh, through family members one individual actually looked on the internet and found the group that way so you can see that actually the group's profile perhaps could be slightly better identified uh, and there may be a slight disjoint between health services and, and actually reaching this, uh, you know, accessing the group uh, can be a little bit of an issue. As you can see from Yvonne's quote here, uh, again, this reflects what we said on the previous slide about the idea that, that Yvonne was, was really wanting to do something purposeful, not wanting to, to sit and, and chat to others on itself. So just some of the ideas that came through from the interviews that I undertook with the individuals. One of the first things that was really important was the idea of reversing the stigma script. So one challenge in joining the group was overcoming the perception of what individual meant. So individuals who have actually been diagnosed with dementia have an idea of what dementia looks like. And it's very different from who they feel themselves to be. The public conception of what dementia is, is really late stages dementia, if you like. And I'll come on to talk more about that in a few slides time. So individuals had to wrestle with uh, this idea of, um, am I this person with dementia? As you can maybe see from Ursula's quotation there, the idea that I can't do anything now, but actually Ursula can do plenty for herself now, as can Lorcan and as can the other group members. And so it's about this idea of, of letting the public know that the common knowledge about dementia is only one aspect of a dementia diagnosis. And there's much more to be said about dementia, especially in the early stages. So for individuals joining the, the group, they, they perhaps are, are coming in with a sense of lost confidence. The fact that actually they feel that they aren't capable, that they don't have capacity, that they're not able to speak for themselves. And there's a process that the individuals then have to go through over time whenever they're actually within the group setting and they begin to watch other group members engage directly with public um, in community settings or with uh, health and social care trusts and so on and so forth. And they actually begin to see, okay, I could maybe do this too. And individuals begin to speak as well as just attend. One individual, it's not just about the stigma of dementia as well, because one individual had been a trainer in her professional life before she was diagnosed. And so she had to overcome the hurdle of, whenever I was training, I was beginning to lose uh, the, the thread of things on occasion. And just building that confidence up again was, was difficult for her. But again, she achieved that over time. So a couple of the key things that people are actually doing in these groups. So firstly, they're changing minds. So in other words, going out and educating people about what it is really like to have dementia. Rushing's quotation here is quite interesting in this respect. It's with a group of social work students. And she was recognizing that individuals were coming up to her at the end and saying, we, we just didn't think somebody with dementia was, was like you. We thought it, it was this person who was at the, at the end of their life. And just being able to hear from somebody who's able to articulate their story very well, really help people recognize that there are lots of different stages to dementia. Um, but also in terms of where actually people are uh, talking about 
uh, dementia. It's not just in colleges, it's also places like call centers, for example. It was at, at, at breeders uh, groups and also community groups and different things like that. So anywhere that the group could have or the charity was able to have access, they went and they carried out education sessions with individuals and groups um, who were interested in knowing more about dementia and understanding the challenges better. And the other aspect then, as I mentioned earlier, was this idea of not just, we're not just educating people in the public, we're going to talk to the policy makers, we're going to talk to the people in charge, and we're going to say this is how it is, and this is what we actually want to have changed. And so we have a few quotes here from Zachary and Wilson. There was another uh, member, Lorcan, who talked about actually getting some signage changed in some of the hospitals in his local area. That was an important aspect that, that he wanted to see changed. Um, Zachary goes on to say that he is really keen to talk about this issue and get it really in their face with it. And that's where I'd like to take it into people's faces and embarrass people into being aware of it and change their own practices and views on dementia. So very passionate about actually engaging this level of work. So throughout this, we've noticed that um, the purposes of the support are the empowerment groups in and of themselves to actually educate and to inform and to consult. Those are really worthwhile things to do in and of themselves. But there's a second thing which is beneficial for group members and that they actually feel that they are gaining a purpose for themselves, a purposefulness, something to do during the day, something to actually be engaged with. Um, so it boosts their, in, their sense of worth. They're recognizing they're making a contribution to the wider society. So in terms of just summarizing some of the messages now, the progress to regaining one's voice, the individual is diagnosed with dementia and at that time that can be a very difficult issue for individuals and, and it can have a big effect on self-esteem, self-worth and confidence and uh, their own perception of capacity. So they join the empowerment group, perhaps for support, perhaps as, as we've seen earlier, just sit, sit back a little bit, just hear others talk about it. But as they as they're there for a longer period of time, they become submerged into the group identity and goals, and they gain confidence to be able to speak out and inform others of what it's like. So I just want to spend a little bit longer on this particular slide, because this is some of the questions arising out of the research that was carried out. So the first question there is, who do we think of when we think of someone with dementia? And this really relates to our own ideas in the public about stigma and misunderstandings within the wider culture of what dementia is. And I've used this model from Nguyen and Lee, uh, which talks about how public st stigma then leads on to self stigma. So this idea is the fact that, that what we hear and what is in the public consciousness, the ideas of, of dementia being seen as dangerous, as piteous, as having behaviours which people want to avoid, as media hyperbole about the dementia being worse than death, a bomb ready to explode, the scourge of the 21st century, all these ideas, and they begin to infiltrate the general public's perception of what dementia actually is. And unsurprisingly for the group, the group members, they also take on these perceptions and they also feel, well, this is what dementia is, so this is what I must be. So they begin to self-stigmatize as a result and they have to then overcome that and recognize, actually, I still have capacity. I still have capability. I still have my own voice. So that's really important as part of, um, as part of the group process, but also it's a challenge to us as to what we actually think when we think about who, who is somebody who has dementia. And the second question here is about citizenship or lip service. Um, so perhaps this is a, a slightly deeper kind of question in terms of the group process itself. One of the individuals on a previous slide, I think it was Roisin, talks about the idea of that if she goes to Queen's University, are they going to let her come and talk to a group of students because she just knocks on the door? The fact is, by joining this charity, she gets the access to be able to talk to students and other people. 
but it also means that then she takes on the wider message of the charity group and perhaps that lessens her own individual and distinctive voice <clears throat> and that's a, a challenge sorry that's from Rune, that's more related to the third question apologies there but the second question is more so to do with this idea of the uh the health and social care trusts coming to the charity and saying well engage with us and we'll listen to you but are they listening or are they actually ticking a box for theirs for themselves in terms of this is what we do we go out and we consult with people and the charity is in a potentially vulnerable position with this because they want to obviously have the voices heard uh, but they're also people who re rely on funding and other sources for survival and they're dependent on the fact that do they uh, maintain agency and within the policy focus is their importance valued uh, as, and as much as do the individuals holding the purse strings actually do value the, the charity's work so it's a difficult situation that they're in and for the individuals and the groups I think it is a matter of going back time and again and reiterating the messages and saying again this is what we need to see done you said you were going to do this but we now need to see some message on that so I've mentioned briefly about the third question there. The fourth question, I think again, it's just a reflection really on the study itself. Uh, this study has involved those with early stages dementia. And perhaps one of the things we need to think about is, okay, well, what about those with more advanced dementia? How do we ensure that their voice is heard too, that their contribution is actually recognized? And just related to that and to this research project in general, a final concluding point is really this about we really want individuals with dementia to be contributing to our research and our understanding of what it is like to have dementia, because when research ignores this direct engagement, then our understanding and theory around dementia is built on giving greater weight to the concerns of what Peel calls the worried well, those whose voices are less likely to be restricted by media and who are also more likely to articulate messages that heighten fear, anxiety and narratives of helplessness. So you can see that public stigma is being can be repeated time and again if we decide to ignore the voices of those with dementia. And that's uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Robert. That was very interesting. So next, I'm going to ask Kieran to join us. And we'll see Robert again at the end for question and answers. So um, this is Kieran Murray. He's the activities coordinator um, and accredited psychotherapist with IACP and IAHIP. And he's going to give the next talk. Um, Kim, thank you so much and thank you um, to Engaging Dementia, to Grace and all the team there for asking me to give this presentation. Um, my name is Kieran Murray and um, I'm an activity coordinator with Hollybrook Lodge Residential Units that's based in Inchcore, Dublin. Um, we're managed and run by the St. James's Hospital. Um, I suppose I, just in my introduction there as well, you mentioned I'm an accredited psychotherapist um, so that's with the IACP and IAHIP but I suppose the focus of this talk is really coming from the perspective of being an activity coordinator. Um, so we're a 50 bed residential facility in Inchcore which has a history of of course social and economic um, strife and disadvantage um, but a rich history as well in um, political history and social history as well. Um, the focus of this talk really is, I suppose, listening to everything today, I've wanted to acknowledge the kind of talks that have been given by other uh, people like Dr. Smith and Bernadette Phillips. And I suppose a lot of what I talk about now is probably talking more about putting things into actions and a lot of what the other talkers have mentioned about their studies and groups and programs resonates a lot with me. Um, we've developed a number of individual and group based activity programs for residents. So, of course, the focus being for them to enjoy a good quality of life. Most of our 50 residents would have 
um, a diagnosis of dementia um, and be at various stages of the disease. Um, but what we've done is really like I've built a program for activities, individual and a group. And then on top of all of that, I've really focused on how to actually encompass a connection with the community and to enable people to feel like they're part of something much bigger than themselves. Um, we're located, as you see on this slide, I hope you can see this clearly, um, with Richmond Barracks um, next door to us. If you look at the left hand top corner, um, we're, our nursing home is built on the grounds of the barracks. Um, so you can see there it's been through the 1800s to early 1920s. Um, and then changed over to the Irish Army from the English British Army's um, barracks to moving forward to the 1940s, where the location became more or less a tenements um, facility for the people of the area in the 1940s. And then a new development in the 1969 St. Michael's Estate was built and it very quickly became an area with, with um, problems, social problems. Um, and the last picture on the right, you can see that's just a photograph of the present day um, barracks, the rear of the barracks and to the right, it's hard to see, but that's our building, the red brick building. So it's lovely to share such a beautiful space in the community as well with our neighbours. Um, I suppose over the four and a half years, I've built relationships through partnership, and that's been with um, arts bodies, cultural um, and social enterprises, councils and universities. And it was very purposeful intention I had because I, want, I knew that people who most of our residents actually lived in the community from that area, from Dublin, from Kilmainham, Inchcore, Dublin 8, Dublin 10, 12. Um, so it was really important to acknowledge their place in their community um, and to include people no matter what their level of ability would be. So, um, of course, making their life more meaningful um, and to connect and live in the community. I also um, found that over the years, like reading books like Atu Gawande's um, book on being mortal just recently, I suppose it's just getting more and more knowledge and insight into what it actually means to be a home and the sense of a nursing home and how do we foster a sense of home um, because I find there's a struggle there with people um, using the word home um, believing that they can make our place and the space exactly what they had before and fundamentally there is a difference and I suppose I, I just always strive to acknowledge that difference in that we would like to foster a sense of home um, as best we can. Um, projects that we've done have included baby and toddler groups with Frontline Make Change um, in the local community, music therapy, trips to the IMA Museum, collaborations over the years with Dublin City Council um, from having visual arts artists working with us or composers. And then engagement, like many homes do with theatre groups or woolly farms and the library. We've had fantastic talks by Cathy Scuffle on the history of Dublin pubs and Dublin streets. Um, the College of Further Education for our concerts and our local community um, members approached us this year after COVID to um, fundraise for our residents. So it's really nice again, making us even more deeply embedded into that community of people and it's nice to know they know us and know where we are. And the latest project, the Dublin City Lights 2020. Um, I just want to overview these projects, I suppose. Um, last year, the social enterprise Frontline Make Change approached me. It was actually their uh, manager um, of the children's project, Rachel, that came to me um, and she'd heard of us and she knew that we were close by and basically they lie under the services of Make Change um, where they provide a number of um, services for the community members, including addiction counselling, prison links, domestic violence supports and so on. Um, and they, of course, have the children's project and that's where they provide kind of crash or Montessori supports for families who've been impacted by drug or alcohol misuse. Um, so part of this, a lot went into this project. It took us time. Um, I suppose 
I'm conscious that people listening may be located throughout Ireland in different towns, cities or rural areas. Um, this is just one project that came to be po possible for us um, because of the location. But whether it's a local library, reading group for children or whatnot, maybe this can be incorporated into other homes throughout the country. Um, for us, it meant a lot of planning and preparing, collaborating with Rachel on um, our risk and legal side insurance for both organizations. Um, but when we got all that kind of working behind the scenes completed, it meant that we could work on devising what the activities would be. I'm kind of using a CST, cog a cognitive stimulation therapy approach to the groups in um, coming up with the activities um, for the residents. And what we had were four to 10 toddlers meet with about six or eight of our um, residents that the toddlers start calling nannies and granddads. Um, it was really, really nice because there were lovely things that happened like a baby a little toddler on her way home one day driving by started crying and asking to see her granddad and her own parents it took them a few days to realize what was going on and what they, she meant um and the story came back to us that she was missing her granddad um this is just a, a small photograph of our 102 year old resident working with a two-year-old and the only thing I kept saying at the time was that your heart would just burst with joy when you'd see and be in a room full of children roaring, screaming, jumping, dancing, moving, singing, and residents just feeling like they were engaged and taking part and meeting that intergenerational gap and need. Um, from a cognitive stimulation therapy outcome point of view, of course, it was one of those it's a no-brainer and um, there were high levels of enjoyment, interest, mood, communication throughout and some of our residents, you know, would ask for the babies and toddlers in between sessions. So every Friday they'd meet and during the week they'd be looking forward to seeing them again. Um, our music therapy in, um, took place as well. Last year I was lucky enough again to be able to collaborate with Dublin City Council, the culture company, and then also mapping in with the Global Brain Health Institute and we were able to um, work on getting a music therapist um, to work with us and the residents. And what we did was we hosted the meetings in the Richmond Park. So what it became was an outing and experience in the community for our residents. Um, the Global Brain Health Institute courses, I think is highlighted throughout this um, conference as well, but they're obviously um, there to improve brain health and reduce the impact of dementia worldwide. And one of the Atlantic fellows was music therapist Cheyenne Meese from the US, from Kentucky. Um, so she hosted weekly sessions every Wednesday in the Richmond Barracks, and we'd bring a group of residents to that. Um, the council's culture company, they have various programs in place, and they kind of run two venues, Henrietta Street and Richmond Barracks. And one of their engagement coordinators, Lisa Gray, hosted our group in the barracks um, every Wednesday. Um, she has extensive experience in working in museum spaces, communities, and in inviting people to connect with and use, use those spaces. Um, and we were one of the first groups, I think, to meet with them in the barracks. And um, they were hosting what they call Wonderful Wednesdays. So they would ask teams, clubs, organizations, classes to come and spend their day or time in the barracks. So our residents were really not just there on their own. They were getting to meet other people. They were meeting people on their way to their cafe. They were engaging with them. They were saying hello. They were getting that feedback. And sometimes they'd meet people that they live their lives with in the community. Um, so Cheyenne um, would come to us every week and of course then March hit and COVID-19 happened and it continues to of course impact all of us but um, it meant that the sessions, the baby and toddler group and music therapy finished so it was unfortunate and as Yates, I'm quoting here, all is changed, changed utterly. Um, this really had an impact on us. Um, we had an outbreak in the nursing home and really it, it was a, a kind of harrowing time um, for residents, for families and for staff. But I suppose it gave some time, of course, as well, later on during the um, recovery stage to 
actually have time for reflection. And despite everything, I was shocked. There's been actually a paradigm shift I've noticed in the um, center. Um, rather than, I thought there would be total, um, there'd be no way to actually ever get back to what we had, but rather than being reactive, I suppose, we've actually become very responsive. Um, and I suppose I would encourage other places to um, have that approach to this shock um, that's hit us through the disease of COVID-19. So um, our units, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. I'll, I'll move on. Um, Anyway, basically what we've done is because so much has stopped, uh, we really start to explore, well, what can we do to integrate the residents into the community again? And again, with Lisa and the culture company, we've been working on a new project. So despite everything, we've been coming up with ways of engagement and um, enabling residents to really take part and participate and contribute to Dublin and to the local area. So what we've done is we've partnered with Lisa. We've also um, worked with artist and illustrator Alan Dunn. And the objective of our latest project is that we will give stories, artworks and information to Alan and that he would then use that information and turn it into a graphic novel that will um, be projected onto City Hall during December 2020. So it's a nice project. It's really nice to be able to call families and update them and tell them how their residents, their loved ones are doing and let them know that they are involved and in integrating and taking part in projects and group work within the um, within the Hollybrook Lodge. Um, so we came up with a framework and methodology for this. Um, we co-created workbooks so people can do individual tasks and activities. Some of the residents like to color in or write, tell stories. So it's pr provided a, a method for facilitating um, getting stories and um, getting, you know, input from each individual, those who might not want to attend groups, for example. Um, and it's just been a pure joy. And actually, one of the things that keeps coming through in all these sessions has been where I facilitate them. There's just messages of hope and survival. We might ask residents, what would they like to tell the people of Dublin? And they mention things like how they got through scarlet fever years ago and um, how they need to look after each other and how that's always been the way for people living in Dublin through strife or through, through hard times. So it's been really nice to see the themes of hope and renewal come through. Um, I suppose here, I just wanted to make a comment about, you know, where why I suppose I've invested so much energy in these projects and facilitating these has been, of course, um, to make a, hopefully a place, a happier um, home for people. So. Um, the idea of happier older people make care homes better places for residents, relatives and care staff. Um, and it's been just really important to enable residents to engage in the community. And back to my point earlier, a residents um, said to me before, this will never be my old home. Um, but um, and I agree, I totally understand that. And sometimes it's hard to meet expectations um, for individuals or for families. Um, when a person has actually been moved from their home place. Um, but what we keep doing, uh, I suppose, is to try and provide a secure base and safety and build trust within our teams with the residents. Um, I've been lucky to have support from everyone. And I suppose ultimately what I would say is that it's been, I've been privileged to get to do the actions and to just do things, do the work, engage with residents and connect them to the community. Um, I think it's making a big difference in how they feel um, life is for them in the residential unit. Um, and I suppose if people want to contact me, please do. I understand what I'm sharing is not necessarily a, you know, something that can be easy for people living in West Galway or Kerry, but um, I'm sure there are projects that are sitting and available in the community and just waiting to be engaged with um, and waiting for that leadership. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kieran. That was a lovely presentation. Really interesting. So now I'd like to introduce Emma. Emma Gannon is Senior Occupational Therapist at Clontarf Hospital. 
Um, thank you very much for having me today. My name is Emma Gannon. I'm a senior OT in Clontarf Hospital, and I'm going to be presenting about our dementia and delirium awareness training, which is adapted to a rehabilitation setting. Um, so I qualified as an occupational therapist in 2010, and I've been in Clontarf Hospital, which is a rehabilitation hospital since 2017. Um, and I have a passion for person-centered uh, and dementia care. So just to go through a little bit of what, what, what the presentation will be about. So I'm just gonna go through the background, the Irish context in terms of policy and population and how Clontarf Hospital fits with that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how as a hospital, we decided to form an MD, MDT Dementia Care Committee in 2017. And from that, our education subgroup was developed where the training came from. So just a little, just to look a little bit in terms of the Irish context, in terms of population. Um, so I suppose it, these figures are well known that every day in Ireland, 11 more people are diagnosed with dementia. Um, approximately 55,000 people live in Ireland with dementia at the moment, and that's estimated to double by 2036. Um, half a million people in Ireland whose families have been affected by dementia, and 63% of people with dementia currently living in the community. So I suppose as a rehab hospital, it's imperative for us to um, have the knowledge and the training to um, complete rehabilitation with all patients, but with patients living with dementia as well, uh, and to be aware of all community supports um, for patients to maintain at home. So just to look at the National Dementia Strategy, which is completed in 2014, and the below priority action areas one to six. So, so, we, so I suppose our MDT Dementia Care Committee really fits with the first three priority action areas in terms of timely diagnosis, support for carers and patients, and raising awareness and understanding. Um, so I suppose education is essential for all persons living with dementia and their carers in order to, to empower them to live a, as best a quality of life. Um, and it's really important that they're seen by staff who are appropriately trained um, as well. So it's really important for us to, to look at that. So in terms of Clontarf Hospital, so we're, we're a rehabilitation hospital, we're a 160 bed rehabilitation site. We've had an evolving patient profile change from 2014. Previously, we would have only taken patients post orthopedic surgery. Uh, but then in 2014, we started taking two streams of rehab from Bowen and the Matter Hospital, which was older adult rehab. Um, and I suppose there was there was felt to be um, because there was felt to be a subjective gap in knowledge uh, regarding um, people's ability with dementia to engage in rehab. Um, and there was also I suppose as part of our criteria for admission to Clontarf Hospital, uh, the criteria was that people didn't have any cognitive difficulties to allow them to be admitted. Um, and subjectively, we knew there was many patients here that did have cognitive difficulties, um, and we also knew that they absolutely could engage in rehab and benefit. Uh, from rehab at all stages of dementia. So because I suppose there wasn't the objective data on how many patients we did have with cognitive difficulties, the OT department did a snapshot audit over three years where we did cognitive assessments on every patient in the hospital and um, to I suppose to check uh, how many patients were having cognitive, cognitive difficulties. And every year it's kind of been a high enough level that's come back at least 64% of patients coming back with difficulties on a, on a, on a formal cognitive assessment. So we needed to look, I suppose, at patient-centered care and improving patient care and our patient journey experience for all our patients. So just to look at our most recent cognitive audit. So this was a cognitive audit we completed in February 2020, so kind of pre-COVID. Um, so this is an audit we did where we completed cognitive assessments on all patients in the hospital. Again, just to check where the level was in terms of cognitive difficulties. 36% um, came back as having no cognitive issues and 64% came back as having cognitive difficulties with 20% moderate difficulties and 7% severe difficulties. Uh, and interestingly about this audit, uh, only 11% of the patients who were, were, who were indicated with a cognitive difficulty had a diagnosis of dementia. Uh, and there was also a high correlation between increased length of stay for the patients who had a severe cognitive difficulties, they ended up staying longer in hospital. So I've spoken a little bit about the background, I suppose. Um, so the Clontarf Hospital and the evolving patient profile change in 2014 and the gap in staff awareness um, and knowledge of treating patients um, living with dementia. Uh, and because of this gap in knowledge, the MDT Dementia Care Committee was set up in January 2017. And from that came our education subgroup. 
So the MDT Dementia Care Committee was set up, as I said, in January 2017, and invites were put out to all uh, disciplines. So at the moment, we have disciplines from OT, physio, nursing, pharmacy, poetry, and social work, to name a few. Um, and I suppose our role is to, is, is to advise the organisation on treatment and rehab for patients with cognitive difficulties. Um, and we look at three key areas. We look at education, um, quality initiatives, and formal care pathways. We meet every two months as a main dementia care committee and our subgroups who are responsible for the quality initiatives would meet more regularly and feed back to the MDT dementia care committee uh, on a two monthly basis. So the main focus of this uh, presentation is about our education group, but I just wanted to uh, briefly discuss our other subgroups that have come from the dementia care committee. So we have a delirium group, uh, and that's a group specifically around raising awareness of staff of delirium. Firstly, I suppose prevention, but then identification if it does become an issue and treatment as soon as possible. Uh, we're also looking at putting a formal pathway in place um, to manage patients with delirium in Clontarf Hospital. We have a PR group or a public relations group. Um, and what we do is we promote the Dementia Care Committee among the hospital, I suppose what quality initiatives we're doing, again, raising awareness among staff and also trying to um, attract new members to the committee. We have an environmental group which audits the dementia friendliness of the hospital. Uh, and we've made significant changes to the hospital in the last year. There is a poster presentation later on in the day at five o'clock. My colleague, Jared Matthews, is presenting on that uh, later on today. We also have a patient ID group, and that's an, a group we're hoping to trial in January of next year. Uh, and that's a, a group where patients who come in with an identified dementia or delirium um, or a, maybe a moderate cognitive difficulty in assessment um, are discreetly identified with their consent once they're happy with it are discreetly identified uh, on nursing and poultry and uh, uh, catering handover, just as opposed to identify that, that patient that they might need more time and to uh, uh, increase staff awareness that they might need more time and more assistance. And also for us as an MDT to prioritize those patients to try and ensure that their, dis their rehab and discharge is optimum and as quick as possible. So the dementia and delirium awareness training, so that's, I suppose, the focus of this presentation. Uh, so D-Dash, we call it for short. So I suppose why reinvent the wheel? We know there's dementia and delirium awareness training programs uh, in the HSE and NHS, but I suppose we wanted to do it as a bottom-up education approach for staff, by staff, and also to have a specific focus on rehabilitation. Um, so initially we did a focus group with interested staff members to see where the gaps were in terms of knowledge and treatment of patients living with dementia. Uh, we did a literature review and evidence-based and we looked at programs that were currently running in the HSE and NHS. Uh, educational material for the presentation was received from OT, nursing, uh, medical, pharmacy and dietetics. Um, it was a power, two hour PowerPoint presentation and it was piloted with that uh, same focus group um, and feedback from that focus group was used to finalize the formal training content. Uh, the training was NMBI accredited and launched in March 2018. So I suppose the course aim, so the thing about this training is we wanted to have a rehabilitation focus and enablement focus. Uh, and we also want to, I suppose, target P, uh, all, all members of the hospital. So it's about trying to find the right level. Um, so catering for people from uh, catering staff, medical, nursing, administration. So we wanted to target everyone. So it's in, to increase all staff awareness throughout the hospital about dementia and delirium and its impact on how patients function to enhance care and provide person-centered care for all our patients in Clontarf Hospital, but particularly those uh, per patients living with dementia, and to promote all staff to be advocates for patients with dementia. So the course content, so we go through the background in terms of why the MDT Dementia Care Com Committee was set up and the change in the patient profile in Clontarf Hospital, uh, what the rationale was and the course aim. Uh, we define dementia, so we define dementia in the most common types. Um, we look at delirium and assessment, uh, prevention and treatment. We talk about dementia and how it's diagnosed. We have a big emphasis on person-centered care, so uh, seeing the person, uh, be, or seeing the person, not the dementia, or seeing the person, not the condition they come in with. 
um, and enablement of all our patients, but particularly those uh, patients living with dementia. We also have a large focus on rehabilitation of the person with dementia and strategies we can use to assist with that. Um, we talk about understanding responsive behaviour and how we all play a role in dementia care. So we encourage interaction throughout the training. Um, the main interaction occurs at the end of the presentation where staff uh, reflect on um, their own care in terms of uh, uh, rehabbing persons with dementia and maybe reflecting on things they could do differently in the future. Um, and that staff interaction is really valuable in terms of generating ideas and quality initiatives going forward. Um, the training occurs every two months and it's run by an OT and a clinical support practice nurse. It's been running since March 2018 uh, and 152 staff members have attended sta uh, training to date. So I suppose the rehabilitation focus, and that's our main focus of the presentation, is was it's adapted for a rehabilitation setting. So we focus very much on person-centered care and awareness of specific needs. So not one size fits all, that everyone is different. Um, focus very much on in terms of uh, care and respect and enablement um, of all our patients, but particularly those with uh, living with dementia. Um, and Marguerite had a lovely quote earlier in the morning where she um, said to focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. And that's a really lovely quote to bring back to the training as well. Um, and not to underestimate the, the person uh, with dementia and their ability to engage in rehab and their ability to do things for themselves. Um, we talk about optimal communication. So to be aware of the environment, if it's very noisy, to maybe use a quieter room, to be aware of lighting, um, to be aware of the tone you're using and the language you're using, um, to be aware of the, to give the person the best chance of being able to engage to ensure they have their sensory aids, maybe their hearing aids and their glasses. Um, uh, and we talk about the dementia friendly environment. So we talk about changes we've made in terms of the hospital to make the environment more dementia friendly and how that can impact on a person living with dementia. We talk about very much client centered realistic goals. And um, so again, not a one size fits all approach. It's unique to everyone. Um, ensuring the person is um, involved in all parts of their care. So nothing about me without me that they're involved in all parts of the rehab process and giving the person ownership over their rehabilitation by asking them what do they want to achieve while they're here? What do they want to achieve by the time they've discharged? So they're really kind of steering their rehabilitation. We talk about assisted decision-making and rehabilitation, again, supporting the person, giving them all the information they need to make decisions uh, and supporting them in making their decisions uh, in terms of their rehab and ensuring they're involved in all parts of the rehabilitation process. And we talk about cognitive rehabilitation and different uh, aspects of cognitive re rehabilitation we can use with persons with dementia. So breakdown of participants. So the biggest um, contingent that have attended so far are catering and household at 18%, followed by nursing at 15% and the healthcare assistants at 12%. Um, Evaluation of the training. So we do pre and post 10 point Likert scales. And um, so we've got some really good results from that. So the areas assessed um, include the knowledge of dementia, the knowledge of the impact of dementia on function and rehabilitation, and confidence when dealing with the patient uh, who's living with dementia. So there's been really, so really good objective increases. So there's been a 25% increase in knowledge of dementia a 27% increase in, where, in awareness of the impact of dementia on function, and 24% increase in confidence and caring for a patient with dementia. Uh, we also look at qualitative findings. Um, so we do a video throughout the presentation, just as um, it's a lady from the NHS, Barbara, I'm sure many of you have seen her before. Um, so again, just trying to get the staff to put themselves in the shoes of someone living with dementia. Um, so someone commented how the video element was thought, so thought provoking and has influenced my practice going forward. Um, other people talked about the, the interaction. Um, so we generate really good ideas in terms of staff interaction about what we can do to improve the quality of care we're providing, how we can be more person-centered. Um, so one of our chefs came up with patient meal times together. So generally patients sit on their own for their meal times. Um, and he thought potentially we could sit together for Sundays, bank holidays and Christmases. Um, another staff member commented on how we need reminding how difficult it is for patients in a strange environment. 
Um, and I suppose we need reminding of that now more than ever, especially with visitors restrictions, which are very difficult for patients with cognitive difficulties and how difficult it is being in a strange environment. Uh, staff talked about how it was informative engaging, and engaging and they enjoyed the session and it allowed for class interaction, which is really, really important for the session. Um, COVID has had definitely had an impact in that we cancelled the training for a number of months. We are now back doing the training, but with smaller numbers to allow for social distancing. Um, we had talked about virtual versus face-to-face uh, -face staff training, where maybe we videoed the presentation and asked staff to review the video. But we felt the, the conversations generated and the ideas generated through the training are much better generated face-to-face, -face, so we're continuing with the face-to-face the -face and social distancing. Um, the visitor restrictions are having a significant impact on all our patients um, and I'm particularly on those patients living with dementia um, and we're trying strategies to, to make that a little bit easier for people at the minute. We also know that the environment has had a huge impact um, in terms of our dementia friendly environment. Um, things like um, is that, uh, patients are only allowed to interact with people in their own bay, they're not allowed to interact with people outside their bay um, and they can't, they're not having any group rehab anymore, it's all individual um, so all that is having a significant impact on their experience, uh, on their hospital experience um, and the external COVID restrictions as well are significant in terms of anyone who was potentially shielding or cocooning earlier in the year um, maybe not having as much social interaction um, as, as they would normally have. And that has a, a huge impact on someone's cognition um, and physical functioning. So considerations going forward, definitely to look at the impact of COVID and co incorporate that into our training and maybe to look at ways we can try and alleviate some of those impacts uh, for our patients coming through. Um, we had hoped to have a patient representative on our dementia care committee this year and uh, that unfortunately fell through because of COVID, but that's something definitely we're hoping to look at getting going next year and um, potentially roll out of the training externally to other rehabilitation sites and continuous evaluation of the training as things change. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's my email address. If anyone has any questions or any questions now would be great as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. Have Kieran and Robert join us again. So we actually had one question come in during your, your talk, Emma. Mm -hmm. um, has the policy on admitting patients with dementia changed as a result of this program? Yeah, and I think we all we always did admit patients with dementia and cognitive impairment. Maybe we just didn't realize that, but we're much more open now to it, uh, admitting all patients, but those living with co cognitive impairment as well. And staff are much more aware of how they can engage in rehab and how they can benefit from rehab. Very good. Um, so to the um, attendees, if you have any other questions, you can send them in through the question and answer, answer function, please. Um, that was really interesting from all of you. Maybe just as a last point, um, if no questions are coming in, maybe you could all just shortly tell, tell us what was the largest challenge that you had to face due to COVID and how you, how you coped? I know that's a big, big question, but I was just listening to all of you and thinking how COVID has really played havoc with everything. I suppose the thing for us is the lack of visitors um, and we can really see that impact on, on patients' moods um, and just it, it's so it, it's nearly like they're in a prison when they can't get any visitors for a number of weeks when they're here um, and that has had a significant impact so things we've tried to do are um, set up communication teams where patients can use tablets and use video calls to contact their loved ones um, or in, in, in cases then where it's really difficult, we try to facilitate visits on a kind of a case by case basis. Um, and we also suppose, really try and prioritize to get patients home as soon as possible so they're not here too long and without their family and not having that support. So we try to, particularly those with co cognitive difficulties, we try to prioritize them to get them home as soon as possible at this time. But Very good, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's, a learning, it's a learning curve for everyone, but yeah. Um, there's nothing, something else came in through chat. So how do you include a person with dementia in the group if the person is unaware they have it? Who's that question? 
I don't know that it was specific to anyone. So you guys can all respond maybe. From I suppose I could just say in terms of, um, we, we, I facilitate a lot of groups myself, but we also have other people like OTs, my um, teammates and physio as well, run groups and facilitate. I would say, generally speaking, like a couple of weeks ago, we planted daffodils. So I would use the pool activity levels. So it may be that there's people at the very early stages of dementia to the later stages. It doesn't mean they can't be in that same experience and enjoy it. So you introduce the same activity, but adapt it to each person that's in that room. And whether that's through where they position themselves in the room or where you seat them or what kind of sensory items you introduce. Um, someone might be left to just plant the bulbs themselves while someone else is able to look at the photographs or smell another type of flower or something in the meantime. So there are plenty of ways. It's, ne it's never deterrent to exclude anyone, I believe, um, once you know what level a person's actually at and use an evidence base like the pool activity lab for that. That's an excellent point. Thanks very much. Robert, do you have anything to add? Well, I suppose I'd be coming maybe from a slightly different perspective um, to, to Emma and, and Kieran, And I think, you know, with people who are in the, the, the groups were set up for people who are living within the community, still have quite a lot of independent living skills. Um, and so individuals could only access the group if they actually did have a diagnosis of dementia. But one interesting thing that I found whenever I spoke to some of the people in the group was that they would constantly refer to other people that they knew and they would say, well, this person clearly has, you know, this is my friend or this person I know, they clearly have dementia, but they just, they haven't been through the process yet. You know, they haven't gone to get diagnosed and mm -hmm. things like that there. And that's quite interesting that they can actually see in other people that there are difficulties. Um, and perhaps, uh, I mean, there is quite a lot written on the process of diagnosis and, and how it, it can be quite lengthy. Um, and so individuals are waiting a long period of time to actually get that diagnosis. And, there's a, and I think I suppose for, for maybe for family members and for carers as well, it can be very frustrating to actually have to wait that length of time. Um, but certainly, as I say, you know, for people within the group, they were conscious that yes, we could be providing more support to other individuals, but they just haven't got the diagnosis yet, you know. Very good. Um, so there was some clarification around the question about including a person with dementia who's not aware of it. And they were actually talking, uh, Emma, to your, your <laughs> last slide about the decision-making group. That makes sense to you. Uh, sorry, I need to do it again, the last. What did I say on the last slide? I'm just pulling it up too. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure either. Uh, is it the patient? I think, um, I think it's a representative. Is it a person? Representative on the dementia on committee. The um, so I suppose we uh, we would try and include someone who has been through Clontarf Hospital as a person on the dementia care committee. So someone who's been through the rehab process here, been in the hospital and can feed back to us. Um, and possibly we would probably try to be, include someone with a memory difficulties or a potential formal diagnosis of dementia. Um, but we would try to have someone who's been here and can give us feedback on the care here so that we can make necessary changes according to that. Hope that's okay. right. that answers that question. Very good. Um, Kim, can I just say one thing? You know, the question of the COVID and living through that, we, ha we had an outbreak and we you know, took a number of weeks to actually know we were clear of it. Because every time someone else has a temperature or a symptom, you're you're holding your breath and you don't know when it's going to be acknowledged we're clear of an outbreak. So there's that part of it. There's a loss of confidence I found in myself around group facilitation. Um, but one thing I would say is like our residents, and I've said I found myself saying it a few times, like I live on a street where there are over 80 year olds who have nobody visiting, nobody seen them they can't have their families with them and I suppose what I found myself realizing is in our residential service we have somebody going in every single night morning medicating warm food hot food care groups music entertainment and engagement all the time 
so I think in some way, yeah, we really have missed visitors. We sincerely have, and they've been a loss. But we've also managed to facilitate them as best we can in loads of ways. But I think I see it as we're actually quite fortunate that residents in this day and age can have that actual um, security in a home environment like ours, where mm -hmm. I often think of the people living in Kilmaine and Minchcore in Dublin City just don't have that daily engagement. No, that's a very good point. Thank you, Kieran. Um, we've had another question come in. This one's for Emma. What percentage of staff have completed the training at this stage approximately? Oh, so I would say it's at least 50% anyways. Like our, our, our total that we have includes students as well. So we don't include them as staff, but they're still included in the training. So I'd say we're about halfway through. Um, and then we're just trying to get new staff as they come in. Uh, we have to cancel for a number of months this year because of COVID. Um, but we, we're still trying to uh, get, we're just kind of up and running again in the last couple of months. So we'll try and get one more session before the end of the year and then hopefully get our numbers up for next year again. Very good. No, it's hard right now to try to do that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Everything's more difficult. <laughs> um, very good. So that looks like that's the end of the questions. So I'm just going to launch a poll here. We'd like the attendees just to give us some feedback on the session to know if this was a good way to use your Monday afternoon. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'd like to thank all the speakers again today. Um, as I said before, this has been recorded. So when the recordings are ready and available for everybody, we'll, we'll let everybody know by email that they're up for you to listen to. Great. So thanks again, everybody. And um, Please attend the rest of the sessions. We've got a great program the rest of today and tomorrow as well. And um, thanks again to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.